This is the Connected Baby podcast series, sponsored by you, the listener. If you'd like to help spread the message of the science of connection even further, then you can make a donation at connectedbaby.net forward slash donate. Welcome to the Connected Baby podcast, where we explore how people are putting the science of connection to use in their lives. Hello and welcome to our weekly Connected Baby podcast with Dr. Suzanne Zedeik. And our special guest today is Dr. <laughs> Suzanne Zedeik. It's I, lovely to be back with you, Gary. I love it when we do our one-to-ones. I love having our guests. I really love that, but I do love our one-to-ones. Do you? It's insightful. Is it? It's very insightful. What's insightful about it? Well, I think what's going to be insightful today is us talking about attachment. And uh, and and what attachment means, and actually how you've taken attachment and made it understandable for the layman like me. I think that's fair. It to does say. seem that way from what people tell me. Yeah. Well, let's talk about attachment first of all. Um, well, before we do that, just remind us about the aims of Connected Baby because we've had a lot of guests guests on uh, over the past couple of weeks since we last spoke. And in our first ever podcast, we spoke about the aims of Connected Baby. Just remind us, what are the aims of the organisation? The aims are to help other voices come into this discussion. Because when I started working with the public four years ago now, it was me doing a lot of the speaking, but I kept hearing stories all the time about how people were putting this information into use. And I wanted those stories to be made more public so that other people could hear them and think about it. So that's why Connected Baby was brought in to to bring more voices into the conversation of spreading the science of connection. What amazes me is that over a very short period of time, because four years is no is no length of time at all, really, that you have spoken en masse in various numbers and guises to about 40,000 people. That's right. I find it amazing as well. In fact, if I think back to when I started it, I took voluntary severance from the University of Dundee thinking I was nuts because I was giving up a well-paid, well-pensioned job. Many people will have heard me made that joke, but it's true. And I was doing that middle of a really bad recession and I was trying to get the public interested in science. And I thought you could be nuts here. But I really, really wanted to give it a shot. And what is astounding is the number of people who really do want to know about this science and and the excitement around it. So it was, you know, it was worth the risk. But you don't know that when you're taking the risk. So many professional organizations talk about attachment uh, and they understand it as to what it is. But actually, for for somebody who's listening to this podcast today, wherever they may be in the world, who they may have, may have heard of attachment, but they don't really have an inkling or an understanding, tell us tell us in simple terms what attachment is. I'm extremely happy to do that, but actually, I'm going to rework your question because it's true. There's a surprise. <laughs> Lots of people will identify with that, of that reworking that I do. It's true that lots of professionals have training in attachment. But in my experience, there's actually a a lot of those professionals don't really understand it. And I was surprised to discover that because, of course, I taught attachment to students in university for all the years, the 20 years that I was there. And when I began to work more with professionals, because I knew they'd had training in attachment, I thought that that understanding would be pretty well spread throughout the fields. And I now know it isn't. And here's why I think it isn't understood, either by professionals or by the general public. I think it's because of the language that we use. The science of attachment has been with us very much since the 60s and really started in the 40s with the war, actually. So the evacuation of children to areas of safety. There were psychologists who were worried about the impact that was having, especially on younger children. And they were trying to get the government to rethink that evacuation policy. And they were right, because we now know that especially the youngest children who were sent to stay with strangers, many of them suffered for the rest of their life with trust and anxiety and fear because they had such a long period of time with people who weren't familiar. 
that grew into a science by the 60s and 70s, and lots of professionals have been trained in the science of attachment since the 70s. But we stuck with very scientific language and ways of seeing it. So John Bowlby, who uh, is really known as the father of attachment theory, developed language like secure and insecure attachment. And then we have these fancy categories called avoidant attachment and ambivalent attachment, only sometimes that's called anxious attachment. Now there's disorganized attachment. And all I have to do is say those terms and already people are going, what? That seems big. I'm, I'm a bit confused. But that's the kind of language that has continued to be retained in training. And what I tried to do was change that language to give us more access to what attachment really is. Are we all detached in some way? You, are you not attached? That's no. what I mean by detached. Or I'm, no. I mean, go on. Definitely not. Right. We are all attached in okay. some way. Now, sometimes people use the word unattached or not attached. Actually, that's not accurate. I totally understand why people use that language. And what they mean is they feel a bit detached. If I used my language, what they are is scared of connection. That's aren't why we they all in some way? Aren't we all? I mean, every human being. Do you know any one human being that is, that's fully rounded in, in, oh, in this area? That's such an interesting question. Once again, I'm going to rework your question. <laughs> <laughs> why am I here? Why am I here? <laughs> If we understand that babies come into the world already connected and needing connection, and that for human beings, feeling connected is to feel safe. That's the bo bottom line, fundamental message that I'm trying to help people to understand that the science tells us. We all come into the world expecting connection. That's the way our brains are wired. And then what happens is that you have all these experiences as a baby of connection. For some babies, those experiences of connection feel safe and lovely. And for other babies, connection doesn't feel so good. So actually, connection comes to feel a bit scary. We're still connected. It's just that connection is a harder place to be. And in some of the earlier podcasts, we made a slight joke about you being slightly avoidant. This is, this is where you start to think, oh, this is getting a bit personal, except that this stuff is personal. What that means is that certain areas of emotional contact with another person doesn't always feel comfortable for you. And so you do what every single other human being does. You seek an emotional place that feels safer less overwhelming, less risky, less... Ooh. Some people need to go to that place of distance in order to feel comfortable. Other people need to get much closer to feel comfortable. It's understanding that process of what feels comfortable about relationships that is attachment. So we're all connected and we need connection. We just experience it and do it in different ways. Are there other countries and cultures that are better at that stuff? I'll tell you where that question comes from, is that in the UK, mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say we can be a little bit anal, a little bit uptight. <laughs> Those are your words, yeah. Those are my words. I wouldn't put but words in But I totally in, in get that, what you mean. In that lovely American mouth of yours, <laughs> I wouldn't do that. But we can be. As a, as a nation, we can be We can be a little bit uptight. We don't like to complain too much, all that usual stuff. Yep. I mean, this is all very well documented. Yep. Are, are, are there other countries and cultures that are better at connection than, say, we are? You tell me. Would well, you say there are? Well, uh, I, I would think that, and I could be completely wrong here, but I think the United States are probably... Very good at that sort of thing. Because, good at connecting. Because I, because I think you guys sort of big and brash. Okay. And um, and probably a little bit in touch with your feelings. You're, a, you're an emotional race. So, okay. So that's a very interesting contrast. Bring in one other. Just bring in another country to, to think. What is, what's another country that you think does this well in your experience? Uh, do, 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 France or Italy. Okay. And what do they, what do, they do? Well, there's a lot more hugging. Okay. There's a lot more kissing of cheeks. Okay. There's a lot more, uh, you know, guys don't mind hugging each other okay. on the street. Um, and maybe actually in some Middle Eastern countries as well. Right. All of those examples that you've just called to mind are examples of 
attachment and our, and attachment behaviors. And if we come to understand that, then we get our heads around, okay, what are relationships? What are attachment? What's culture? And seeing that, that seeing hugging and kissing through a scientific lens is both fascinating and a little unnerving because you think, is that science? That is what the science of attachment helps us to think about. So if, if we're uptight in Britain, and I can say we now because I've been here you know, for more than half my life. So um, I get it. You know, I've chosen to be here and stay here and make this home for me. And of course, that's part of what attachment is, is home as well. So if, if you would label Britain as a bit anal and a bit uptight, where do you think Not that- in a cockney accent. <laughs> she like. We don't all speak like that, you know. Anyway, go on. Sorry. Where does it come from, do you think? Probably, probably our history and our knowledge and, and what, we've, what we've been um, um, subjected to and what we've seen in the media, what we read in the press, what we've learned from our parents. All of those things. And if we make it really concrete, I think we talked about this in a previous podcast, but it's worth talking about again. What happens when two-year-olds have temper tantrums? Okay, so in Britain, if a two-year-old has a temper tantrum in the aisles at ASDA, what our culture tells us is to get that kid to shut up immediately, don't give them any attention, and get them out of ASDAs quickly. Partly because we're afraid that there's going to be somebody at the end of the aisle in ASDA going, tut, 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 can't you keep that kid under control? That's where I think it comes from. Okay, because what happens is that because we get anxious that we're being perceived as a bad parent and our child is, quote, out of control, we think displays especially of negative behavior are bad and that your child is being bad and that they often need disciplining for that. Actually, if we understand the science of connection, a two-year-old doesn't have a complete brain yet. Their brain is still developing. And what's happened very often with a temper tantrum is that they got overwhelmed. And in ASDA, they might have got overwhelmed by the wish for Smarties. And they've been lovely all day. They went to nursery. They managed without you. They've managed the car ride. They've done all of that. It's the end of the day. And now all they want is a pack of Smarties. And you've just told them no. And they got totally overwhelmed by, especially by the disappointment. And their brain can't handle that disappointment. So they have a meltdown. That's why they have a temper tantrum. What they need is our help and our support and under- and comfort, which will sound nuts to lots of parents. You want me to comfort a child who's throwing a strop? What I really want is for us to understand that that child is in distress and then decide how to help support that distress. And since in Britain, we tend not to do that. What we learn is that negative emotions are this scary thing and you're not allowed to have them and you're supposed to have them under control. If we were able to have more negative emotions and know what to do with them, we'd be less uptight. By the way, <laughs> uh, nice nod to Asda there in that last link. Uh, other supermarkets are available. We just need to That's that true. Quick. And actually, if Asda wants to come and ask <laughs> me how they can help not have conflict in families, we could talk about how they could do that. So there's even room for the science of connection in supermarkets. Let's see, I like, I like the way you got it in there. Uh, Saber Tooth Tigers and Teddy Bears is a title of a book that the 40,000 people that you've spoken to over the past four years have, uh, have heard about. Yes. Many have read it. That's true. Tell me about it. Sabertooth Tigers and Teddy Bears is the language that I use to talk about attachment. And it's different from that language I talked about earlier of secure and insecure attachment. But I'm, try- I'm saying ex- the same thing. I'm just trying to use different language to talk about it. And Sabertooth Tigers and Teddy Bears captures the two key elements of attachment theory. The first is... The babies arrive on this earth scared, which is a surprise to a lot of people. The reason that babies are scared or anxious is because in our evolutionary history, babies who didn't have someone to look after them got eaten by predators like saber-toothed tigers. And so the babies that survived were the ones that could keep someone in love with them enough to look after them to keep them away from danger. So that means the ones who couldn't do that were the ones who got eaten. 
our brains know that we need to have somebody look after us. We're dependent on that. And so we're highly attuned to when we piss off our caretakers to when our caretakers take their attention off us. And if we don't get enough reliable attention, then we monitor our caretaker really hyper vigilantly. People, children who have to do that, if you're putting energy into monitoring your caretaker because you're anxious that they're not paying attention to you, that creates anxiety pathways in your brain and you're more likely to produce cortisol, which is a hormone of stress in your body. Children who don't have to unconsciously extend that energy can are calmer and they can take more risks and they their body has a different way of operating. So the first idea in that is saber-toothed tigers, which captures the idea that babies are anxious and scared and need protection. And then teddy bears captures the idea that babies need comfort because we all know what a teddy bear does. It it's to comfort you when you're scared and feeling alone. So I think that what we need to do is think in terms of growing internal teddy bears in our children. That's the point of secure attachment, is that you have a strong internal teddy bear that you can draw on for comfort when you're feeling anxious. And if we go back to my earlier, earlier example, if you're a parent of a two-year-old who's throwing a strop in Tesco's, Morrison's, Sainsbury's, ads does. you need a strong internal teddy bear because you're embarrassed. If we have strong internal teddy bears as adults, then we are better able to tune into our children's emotional needs because sometimes they're overwhelming and exhausting and tiring. That picks up on all the empirical evidence that adults who are securely attached tune into their children's emotional needs more. Some of your colleagues in the scientific world and the academic world have looked at you a little bit sideways from That's time to true. time when you talk about this. Why? Because to me, it makes complete and utter common sense. So why would anybody want to com complicate it with even more scientific hoo-ha? It's a really good question. And of course, my, my heart goes out to both the public and the scientists. The scientists, look, I'm a scientist by training. And in my heart, I'm a scientist. Scientists like very precise language. And that often means that it's a bit exclusionary language. And we're doing our best to describe data that we're seeing. And that's what John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth, who did key empirical work with him in the 70s, were trying to do. In fact, Mary Ainsworth, she came up with secure and insecure attachment, if we like that language, by going to observe children interacting in other countries. And she could see that there were different ways of interacting. And she wanted to capture those patterns. So she came up with the language of secure and insecure attachment, and then the other categories of avoidant and ambivalent. And then later we came up with disorganized. Those are scientists trying to be very precise. And scientists need to be precise. And they feel secure in precise language. But because they know how to use that language, it doesn't necessarily extend to other groups, like the public. But this weird thing happened with the theory of attachment. And I've often thought about why did that happen, and I'm not sure if I know. But once that language was established in the empirical evidence base, it just continued to be used. So that language of secure, insecure, avoidant, disorganized, ambivalent is what is included in training for social workers and teachers and nursery staff. And it, it it's, feels complicated, so it gets lost. So as I began to realize that saber-toothed tigers and teddy bears, which wasn't a language to me to begin, it was just a metaphor. But as I realized that metaphor worked, I used it more and more. It works immediately. I know, that's what's amazing about it. It works immediately. And I discovered that a bit by accident. In other words, it wasn't planned. It's just, I used it one day in a talk. In fact, I used it in a talk in Fife to head teachers, if people want to know when it's dated to. And, and I watched the way they reacted. And I heard over tea, people going, oh yeah, I had a saber-toothed tiger moment. You thought, I thought, a saber-toothed tiger moment, what's that? And then I realized they were using that language and converting into what made sense for them. So in an earlier podcast, we had Tamsin Jenkins talking about what it was like to be a baby in a 
incubator, and she came up with the phrase, being in the tiger's den. I never use that language. That's her language. But it shows that it works immediately. The reason I think it works is because all I have to do is say saber-toothed tiger, and all of us know immediately that would be bad. They're dangerous. They have big teeth. It brings up in us a sense of fear. And immediately you can get, that's what my babies are feeling? Oh my God, that's why they cry in the lounge while I go to the loo. And teddy bear does the same thing. We all instinctively know that teddy bears are for comfort. And so we get it. And when I go, an internal teddy bear, people kind of get it. That would mean you would have to have internal comfort. So here's what I now think is amazing about that language. I mean it both metaphorically. Right? So saber tigers and teddy bears are metaphors for those ideas. But I also mean it quite literally, because saber tooth tigers would have once have eaten us. And teddy bears are literally comfort. So it's kind of amazing that I stumbled across this language that works both metaphorically and quite literally and theoretically and empirically based scientifically and so straightforward and simplistically that the public gets what was once an exclusionary language. I think that is absolutely amazing. And it happened quite dynamically and authentically. I'm going to use one of your words now. What? Breathe. <laughs> Um, here's a question, right, that people might think. Yeah, here's, a, here's a question. If you take your baby everywhere with you, so say if your baby cries when you leave the living room, you go to the toilet, you want two minutes peace or whatever. Yep. Yeah. Uh, or you take your child with you everywhere. Does that lessen their, their independence as an individual later on in life? Yes. Which might surprise a lot of people listening to this. Mm hmm People who know a little bit about attachment think of it as that bond and that we need to attune to our babies and we need to be close to them and we need to pay attention to when they need comfort and they're scared. Absolutely. But there's another half to attachment and that's the need to go exploring. So attachment is about comfort and risk and about being able to share both of those with another person. So a baby needs to be able to take risks. A baby needs to be able to crawl across the room from you. And they're taking a risk. They're exciting. They're exploring their world. But they also need to know that if they get a bit scared, so they crawl across the room and they suddenly find, oh my gosh, I'm across the whole room. This feels scary. They need to be able to turn and find you. They need to know there's a safe base that they can return to if they get a little overwhelmed or if they get really overwhelmed, that that safe base will move to them and come and save them. So if you don't have experiences of being able to take risks, and that physiology that supports that capacity, that you're not scared by risks, in other words, then you can't do life. You can't take risks. So attachment is about helping a baby to take risks and being there to comfort them when they get overwhelmed and upset. So when you hear a parent saying, yep. do you know what? I put little Johnny in his cot. Yep. And, you know, if he starts to cry, I just leave him till he stops. Is that, is that the controlled crying? That's controlled crying. That's controlled crying. And you talk about controlled crying. And I've heard people talk about controlled crying. And that, I probably said the wrong thing because it opens a can of worms. Oh, my God. I'm just thinking I wish you hadn't used that example. That's not in our notes, Gary. Well, we, we can didn't come say back to, to it. We can that. come back to it in another podcast. But it's a great example because it makes so many people uptight. One of the things about parenting advice these days is that it's advice. And I actually try not to give parenting advice. What I want to do is give people information that the science of connection gives us so that they feel more confident about making decisions in their own houses and in their own lives. But I want them to be informed by the best knowledge we have about child development. Right. Controlled crying is very popular these days, especially in British culture. In fact, especially in Anglo cultures, which goes back to your earlier question about culture. When babies are crying, what they're saying is that they're scared and that they're anxious and that they don't like this. If we know that, we can think carefully about what our baby is telling us. Now, 
Some parents will go, precisely, that's why I never let my child cry. And other parents listening to this will be going, exactly, my kid needs to get over it. What we need is to start from this place of knowing that the baby is saying that they're scared. And the key thing is that if you leave your baby to cry for four and five hours, which you hear lots of stories of parents doing that, your baby is so filled with cortisol that it's now really, it's in a really toxic state. So people who advise on controlled crying often say, if it doesn't work, pretty quickly, then it's not going to work with your baby. And I think the understanding that a baby is saying, I'm crying, that the baby's trying to communicate something, helps us to think more carefully about what is my baby trying to say, and how am I going to respond to that, incorporating all this information that's out there. In other words, here's another way to say the bottom line, I guess. Crying is not just a behavior. The baby's trying to communicate something, And the way that we respond will start to shape the baby's expectations of the world. Because we're talking about controlled crying, many parents tell the story that their baby got it in a couple of nights. In other words, got the idea that they weren't going to come and pick them up again. And they got it in a couple of nights, so there was a couple of nights of bad crying, but then it ended. Other parents tell stories that it went on and on for weeks and months. Those are two very different situations, and the science of connection helps us to think about that. Do you know what? So, yeah, I've just, I'm just writing a lot of topics down for future weeks, uh, such as... Sorry, go on. Well, it, we, you've started with a really controversial one, and right? And I'm... I've sli- got a few more, Miss Lee. I'm slightly nervous thinking there will be lots of parents out there wondering if I'm saying that they're bad parents. That's what happens. We get really defensive about this stuff. And what I'm trying to do is help us to be curious about what our babies are telling us so that we can feel more confident about the decisions that we are making in raising babies rather than simply doing things that somebody else suggested we might do. And it makes us all feel more confident And that's what parents really need, is to feel relaxed and confident. It's about getting all the information and making those decisions for yourself. Yes. Um, So, um, hospital or home birth, discuss. No, that's for another one. (laughs) That's for another one. As is, as is, I've got another title for another uh, another podcast later, Nanny or Not, I think we'll call it. These are all, all of these are issues that come back to attachment and the science of connection. Good, 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 good. Uh, we'll look at those in, in future weeks. Um, we, I think it's it's opportune to say that you have uh, a number of materials in terms of books and films that are available on the Connected Baby website. That's true, both free and for purchase. So there's lots of free stuff out there. Yep, including... Including the book. Including the book, Including indeed. the book called Sabertooth Tigers and Teddy Bears. That's true. What's been amazing about that book is that it seems to have been helpful both to lots of individual families and a number of organizations have bought them for the whole of their staff. That's nurseries, health visitors, schools. So I think it's fabulous that a little thin book is useful to both big organizations and individual families. Amazing. So let's leave this podcast with your four words of wisdom. I think it's the four words. Oh, yeah. It's my four. Yeah, yeah, it is four. Yeah. Uh, and and it's dead simple and straightforward. And I must apologize now if I've been a little bit um, stereotypical when describing uh, certain cultures. I don't mean to. It was an overview. But this, but don't, actually, I'm, don't apologize. Be curious because it helps us to, to wonder where do those ideas come from and how do we talk about this without getting defensive? How do we stay in a curious place? Okay, those four little words. Those four little words are, when people force me to say, what should we do? Because lots of people want to know what to do. This is what I say. We listen, we laugh, we cuddle, and we breathe. And that is at the heart of how to help us to stay calm and come away from overwhelm, which is the point of attachment how not to get overwhelmed, and that's what our babies need, and that's what we need as grown-ups as well. Listening, laughing, cuddling, and breathing. Dr. Suzanne Zedike, uh, excuse me, until next week. Thank you so much, Gary. <laughs>
This was a GRC production for Connected Baby. See, I can't even get my bloody words out now. Why can't you be called Smith? I wish that I had said, and if there's nobody in the world who needs to breathe more than me. <laughs> How was that, guys? Was that all right? Yeah. Good, good. Was it okay? We're on our way to the Suzanne and Gary show. Sorry, the Gary and Suzanne show. <laughs> no, it will always be the other way. <laughs>